Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting in about 10 minutes. Great. Hi, How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Hope you're doing well. Oh, yes. Okay, and it looks like we have our presenter, Dr. Oshinsky, who's just joined. Alex, please um, make me a host or something so I can share my screen. You are a co-host currently, Michael. Are you not able to share your screen? Okay, now it does, thank you. Yep, no problem. To everyone on the call so far, it's just a reminder, we are recording this session. So with your continued engagement, you are acquiescing to be part of this recording that we will be putting out afterwards. I'll make an announcement again before we start, but thanks. Okay, how's that look, Alex? Looks good from here. And I think I'll turn my camera on, what do you think? Yep, looks good.
some people still connecting, so we'll wait a minute or two before we start. Just speaking to give you guys a chance to test your audio, make sure you can hear me. Okay, still still have a bunch of people coming in, so I'm going to wait another minute. Michael, let me know before you start, just so I can do the recording. Yep, uh, will do. Again. Yep. You're doing the, mit, uh, the admittance for all the participants, Alex? Okay. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, I think we can get started. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is just a reminder that we are recording this session for posterity uh, and for release to the rest of the public who weren't able to make the webinar today. So by continuing to stay on the line, you are acquiescing to being recorded. Um, so with that, take it away, Dr. Oshinsky. Thank you, Alex. First of all, I wanna thank uh, DP Moapatra and Becky Roof for helping put together this presentation. Of course, the technical assistance for Alex and all his help has been really um, valuable in putting this together. Today, we're gonna do a webinar on a new set of funding announcements for non-addictive analgesic therapeutics development in the NIH HEAL, Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative. The goal of these funding announcements is really to support research and bridge the gap from target discovery to therapeutics development. The NIH HEAL initiative, helping to end addiction long-term, 
has two main priorities. One is to address the opioid epidemic, and the second is to address the pain epidemic. In the domain of addressing the pain epidemic, the goal of the, H, uh, the NIH HEAL initiative is to enhance pain management. These set of funding announcements that I'm going to discuss today is to directly address the accelerating and discovery of non-addictive pain treatments. These goals for the NIH HEAL initiative related to pain research are really the result of a series of meetings convened by the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, the IPRCC, which coordinates research activities among many different federal agencies, such as the DOD, the NIH, the FDA, uh, the CDMRP, et cetera. And the gaps that were identified inside the, and then subsequently published in the Federal Pain Research Strategy in 2017, identified a need for fundamental research for validating targets and supporting early discovery efforts in therapeutic development for pain treatments for a wide variety of pain disorders, acute pain, chronic pain, post-surgical pain, chronic migraine, fibromyalgia, musculoskeletal pain. I can name almost any different organ and the pain syndromes associated with it. And there is a real dearth of non-addictive focused or targeted treatments for those different disorders. The goal of these funding announcements is to provide the resources and the structure in order for researchers in industry and academics and through their collaboration in order to fill these gaps. So if you look at this Chevron diagram, this is an overview of the RFAs, these funding opportunities that are available for researchers to do therapeutic development in the, for analgesics and treatments for pain. Using NIH resources, and um, through collaborations in academics, among academics and in industry. In the continuum from the discovery of targets and validation of them through early preclinical development and then clinical trials and Im Im through implementation and dissemination, the HEAL initiative proposes to support all of these activities in order to get new treatments into the hands of patients and into the hands of physicians in order to address the chronic pain epidemic and acute pain epidemic that we have in the United States. This webinar is gonna be focused on the preclinical and uh, therapeutics development funding announcements. In order to address this, um, this, this need for support of therapeutics development, we've consolidated some funding announcements that we had from the past into um, these three funding announcements, a planning grant, an initial therapeutic development, and an optimization stage in order to take some of the burden away from researchers to do less applying for new awards and to build funding mechanisms that can support them through many stages of the therapeutic development path. And then we developed a planning grant in order to get them ready with the data in order to uh, have competitive applications for those in, uh, initial therapeutic development projects. And the goal of this planning grant and the in, initial therapeutic development projects is to be ready for the optimization stage, which will then take the asset from optimization through um, IND filing and uh, the phase one clinical trials. And I'm gonna give you details on all of these fund announcements in the subsequent slides. But here you should note that the funding announcement numbers that you can use in your favorite uh, internet search engine in order to find the notices for them are RFA NS21-016 for the planning grant 
an RFA NS21015 for the team-based U19 initial therapeutic development, and then the optimization stage projects are RFA NS21010. Oh, yep. Okay. Next slide. All right. So this is a general overview of how these funding announcements work together in order to support all the types of activities that are needed to bring an idea for therapeutics development through the initial development, screening assay development, and then optimization, um, targeting engagement studies, the biomarker studies, and then IND finally, and then first in human trials. And then at the end here, I tacked in the EpicNet, which is another part of the NIH HEAL initiative, which supports phase two clinical trials for um, analgesics and pain therapeutics. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit the detail here. So the planning grant, again, RFNS, RFANS 21-016, if a group has an idea, let's say they have an idea for a target, it hasn't quite been validated yet, they've done some basic science, maybe done some work, a little bit of work in mice, and they wanna build a therapeutics team. And uh, through that team building, build support for a large grant that could then do assay development and development of models, then they should look at the planning grant. If the team is not in place yet, then the, the, this 016, what we call an R34 planning grant, is the one to look at. Now, these projects we imagine, they're just two-year awards, will, fee, will, will gather the preliminary data and prepare the group in order to submit a U19 application, which is a multi-component application that will include support for development of assays, development of new models or endpoints, early pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic biomarkers, and proof of concept studies. They, these are five-year awards. And the goal of these is to gather the entrance criteria or a hit to lead that's required for the optimization stage, okay? So these are two-year awards on the planning side, five-year awards on the initial therapeutic development side, and then the optimization stage are these phased awards, the UG3, UH3. So what's the difference between the planning grant, R34, and the, and the team U19s? The U19 has an entry, entry criteria. And that is to have a multidisciplinary team in place that has therapeutic development experience, pain experience, clinicians, even patients or patient advocacy groups that could give you guidance on what appropriate therapeutics are for the target population for your um, therapeutics development program. In that entrance criteria requires evidence that the group can work and has worked together. And of course, a biological rationale and demonstration of feasibility of that drug development project through preliminary data or through published literature reports is very important for that U19. The U19 is up to five years. There's no opportunity to renew these awards. So the um, goal is to get to that optimization stage within those five years. The restrictions of this grant are budgets up to $1.5 million. And you see that these are multi-component grants and they're gonna need that budget in order to get the work done in that amount of time. And that includes all consortium costs and sub-awards, all right? So 1.5 million is the total here for direct costs. Now the R34, these planning grants, these are a maximum of two years, no opportunity to renew. The budget may not exceed 500K per year, again, including consortium costs. And the goal here with these planning grants is to build that multidisciplinary team and to get that preliminary data and the really shore up the biological rationale and the feasibility for that group in order to then apply for the team U19s. Okay, so that's the difference between those two grants. The U19 is a multi-component award. Now this slide's a little bit complex, and I'm gonna step you through it quickly on this slide, and then I'm gonna give you detail in subsequent slides of all the additional, the, the individual components. Let's focus on the middle of the slide here first, okay? 
during the entire duration of the project, you can imagine the group is developing validation of the target. There's always more work that needs to be done there. Understanding the underlying biology, understanding how the, um, the and through that understanding the, the biology, additional targets may be discovered, which the group might wanna pr pursue. All that can be done during the duration of the five years of the project with this central validation of the therapeutic target and the underlying biology. That's a separate component. Now, once there, um, there's a target identified, which may come from the planning grant or may be identified in the early stage of the, uh, of the U19, then the group will, might wanna develop an assay and maybe take from a library or screen large libraries based on that assay in order to find hits that um, modify that, that uh, particular target that's identified, be it a protein, be it uh, a channel, be it uh, you know, uh, um, a group of cells in the brain. This is really all up to the, the applicants and they can use small molecules or biologics and both of those are responsive to this, to this um, therapeutic development program. Then they could do screening and then a bit of optimization. So that's a separate component over here. In parallel, once they've understood the biology, the group might want to develop and validate new animal models or modify animal models that are currently in existence in order to test the, some outcome measures related to pain or other physiological changes in the animal associated with that target. And that can be a separate component, a research component of this five-year award. Now, this obviously is not gonna start in the first year of the award. So some of these components might start in year two or three, and maybe in the case of the screening only happen for 18 months or two years, and then pass it off to the other components. In order to support the, these three main types of research components, there may be a resource core for animal models or for generating oligos or something, and uh, so that research core resource research cores are um, optional and can be a part of the uh, this U19 project. Data management and uh, a repository for the data in preparation for interacting with the with the HEAL data repository. So there's a um, a mandate to share the data on these RFAs, and you can look at the on the NIH Wheel HEAL website for the HEAL data sharing requirements. It's not the same as many other type of NIH grants, so I encourage you to, to read that. So in order to encourage that data sharing, we're, um, we're building in a data management into this award so that the staff and infrastructure is built for maintaining the data and the metadata that explains the data and exper experiments around it in order to prepare for sharing. An admin core is permitted. And um, in addition, during this assay development and the understanding the underlying biology, um, there can be a separate component for just the development of pharmacodynamic biomarkers to aid in this therapeutic discovery and early efficacy in PK and PD studies. So all that can be done in this one U19 award. So the goal of this U19 is to support multiple projects working together to a central goal with the understanding that some of the projects might not start in the first year and they might not go for the duration of the project, five-year project either. The goal here is a multidisciplinary approach these are cooperative agreements that have significant programmatic staff involvement from NIH in these projects. So those will be re regular meetings of at least on a quarterly basis and at some stages of the project may be more frequent. And then there'll be yearly milestone reviews and those milestones are an important part of the, the application. And we'll get uh, into more detail later in this webinar about what those milestones should look like. For each research project, we need an established BI to be the leader of it, um, but all the projects included here, and there can be up to five different research projects included, have to show unity and they have to show interdependence. There's no independent projects here. It's not um, independent projects like a PO1 
which kind of have a general sensory uh, central theme, these have to be really closely integrated to developing therapeutics and preparing the data package necessary for applying for the optimization stage. Okay. And um, of course, we'll support shared resources, as I mentioned earlier. So for the U19, here are the components of the grant that are required and their page requirements. There's an overall integrated development plan that's required. That's the 12 page part, like the whole grant together. All right. And that doesn't include a, an overall specific aims page. All right. So there's a, an administrative core that's required. All right. And then a data management core for interacting, for storing the data and preparing it for, for sharing. There's an optional resource core and that you get three pages to prepare that. And then these research components, which you can have a maximum of five and the types of components that will be included are, um, are listed here. And um, for these types of projects, you can have a minimum of five, a three, but a maximum of five. And if you skip a component or don't include it, you have to include a rationale for why you're not including that, such as you already have that work done and you're gonna be focusing the efforts of the grants on other components. So it's not just that you don't have the expertise or you don't have, or you're gonna do it some other time. There has to be some plan within those five years to do these five different research components. And I'll show you why they're important. So that validation of the therapeutic topic and the underlying biology could be already done. In most cases, I can imagine those will be ongoing projects and they could be for the duration of the project also because continuous support and a deeper understanding of the biology can lead to um, a more successful later stages for understanding the, the therapeutic and its effects. The development and validation of animal models and or outcome measures may start in the first year or may start in the third year and only go for a year or two. Again, that's a, a component that may not take the duration. The assay development, screening and early optimization, that's assay development for um, developing a screening platform to test molecules and how they interact with the, the therapeutic target. That's the goal of that research component. And um, then the discovery and validation of the pharmacodynamic biomarkers will be at the appropriate por portion um, of there after you, uh, probably after the uh, assay and the screening have been uh, developed. And then the efficacy and pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies can be included also. And then they will also almost surely continue into the next stage at the optimiz optimization projects also. Let's go into some more detail. So what is this multidisciplinary team that we're talking about? It means that th they're individuals that have expertise maybe in the pain biology for a particular pathological condition. And then you might have others who have expertise in developing assays for small molecules. Or maybe you're develop, the goal is to develop a, a biologic and you have experts in modifying uh, proteins or, um, uh, or RNA in order to act as a therapeutic. Do you understand? So all of that has to be brought together in this in this U19 in order to develop a successful application and a successful project. And this has to be done on the front end before the application in order to demonstrate that in the, the, that five years can be used in a very efficient way to, to get all this work done in that amount of time. Each of those sections are gonna need a rationale for the proposed approach. And now, not only the proposed approach for how to do the science, but also for this approach to treating pain in the way that's proposed based on the, the biology that's being used, the biological rationale for the project. The, it, for the therapeutic development plan, the goal of this plan is to get ready for that RFA NS21-010, which is that optimization stage. And it has specific entry criteria. And the goal of the, plan, the, the five year U19 team award is to get that data so that you're ready for the optimization submission. Data management is poor, important. And here's the URL for the NIH um, public access and sharing data requirements. 
And then I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to give you more details now on milestones. Now, this is a significant divergence from many R mechanisms that um, um, academic researchers are used to. So let's talk a little bit about uh, milestones and in these type of grants. Uh, milestones are go and no grow criteria, and they must be proposed in the grant. They have to be quantifiable, well described, and scientifically justified. These milestones act as a gateway for the individual tasks that are proposed in the grant and the individual project components. The pro for instance, the project component for the assay development will be finished when they reach an assay that has X, Y, and Z quantifiable measures. You need a specific aims or a list of activities. Oh, I'm sorry, the specific aims or a list of activities are not milestones. They have to be quantitative. And because therapeutic discovery is very risky, there will be attrition of these projects. We don't expect all of them to go to their five years, okay? And um, that's an important point to make here is that uh, it shouldn't be that your goal, that your lab is 100% funded by um, this type of award because on a yearly basis is a determination of whether or not the project is moving forward and it could stop, all right? So that's an important realization here. I, I should mention on the team development is that we have no expectation that the, expect that the expertise is contained in one institution. Collaboration across academic institutions and companies and also using um, companies that specialize in assay development, et cetera, um, such as CROs is 100% permitted here on the grant, all right? So I want you to know that you shouldn't think who in my institution has all this expertise. What we want is the best person to do that work and collaborate with you in order to get to have the most efficient progress done in the, on the award. So what are examples of good milestones that you should include in your application? And these are, um, for instance, to, to develop assays, developed assays will be performed with the specificity and activity required for the use of a compound or biological screening method. The activity will de be de uh, demonstrated by the following positive control. For instance, that it, it inhibits an enzyme activity by greater than 80%. And there's your quantifiable measure over there. In this case, it's the, we're interacting, uh, the, the example is interacting with a particular enzyme with measurable activity. That's our screen over here or and a negative control so that it does, or it, in this case, it doesn't inhibit the enzyme activity where there's less than a 5% change in that enzyme activity. Um, uh, another example of uh, milestones is that the Z prime score, but let, let's say in the case of a developed assay, the signal to noise precision and dynamic range will be demonstrated by the following. The Z prime score will be um, less than or equal to 0 0.5 again, quantifiable, and then we can say, okay, we can move forward and now do the screen based on this developed assay because we're, we've reached that milestone. And uh, the blinded test retest reliability, the R square will be less than or equal to 0.75, okay? And at least four positive and uh, four negative compounds, as we mentioned earlier. These are just examples of milestones which need to be included in your grant application. Um, there's a link at the bottom here, and uh, these slides will be shared later, um, or you can just go back to this recording and type down what you see on the screen here after you pause. For this URL, where there's some great milestones examples uh, for the Ignite program, which can give you a basis for uh, writing the milestones for this U19 award. Okay. The milestone review uh, will be a part of the scoring for peer review for this U19. So that's uh, one stage of review of the milestones. After the application is scored, and if it's in a possible scoring range, but, but um, when we're considering for funding, the NIH program staff will then reach out to the applicant to, and this is very common, there needs to be a modification of those milestones. Usually they need to be shored up maybe better quantification, maybe some of them added, there were some tasks that didn't include milestones. Um, and then that, before the notice of award goes out, um, th that negotiation will happen. And then there'll be after the awarding, 
an annual milestone evaluation, which will be done by NIH staff to assess the successful achievement of the milestones, the overall continued feasibility of the program, comparing it to competitive landscape for the disease, disease indication or the drug target they're working with, and then comparing it, including HEAL programmatic priorities, and then, of course, availability of funds inside um, the, the HEAL program. And any one of these could support the development of the project based on the milestones or cause the project to be terminated. That's the milestone discussion. Let's get back into discussing those five different types of research components. So again, you need at least three and a total of five of these research components. If you're not going to include any one of these, you have to give a justification for why you're not including it. That means you've done that work already and you have to demonstrate that through publications or data included in the application. The five different components are the underlying biology and validation and discovery of therapeutic targets, the development and validation of animal models and developing new outcome measures, assay development, screening and optimization of therapeutics, and then the discovery and or validation of pharmacodynamic markers and then the efficacy markers and then important pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic PKPD studies. Very important for therapeutic development. For the validation, this component, the validation of the therapeutic target and then underlying biology, it's important to describe the uniqueness and innovative contributions from the approach to understanding the biology and discovering the target, okay? And then include the rigorous validation for that target. Well, what's the plan here? Are you using knockouts? Are you using um, maybe human tissues over here? which will be, even though it's excised human tissue from a, a tissue bank, that will trigger the need for um, human studies, a section of the, of the grant, even though this is not a clinical trial and clinical trials are not permitted on this, on the, in this project that is considered human subject research. Um, so demonstrating that the target exists in human tissues and then um, a, a attributing the biology of the, the target and connecting it to the pain condition that's important. So that can all be done in this part of the grant. Um, it's important to demonstrate little or no addiction potential. This is the goal here is to um, develop non-opioid therapeutics to really change the landscape of how physicians treat pain. So um, those mu opioid agonists are not going to be responsive to this, to these RFAs. Um, and then rigorously validate that uh, the target, as I mentioned earlier. And then during the duration of the project, the, the work done to understand the underlying biology to support the rationale for this therapeutics development can continue for that full five years. Okay, so the development and validation of animal models. Um, you can develop new models, as I mentioned. They should represent and be, demonstrate how they would represent a significant advance over those that are currently available, why they're better. And it would be best to show how they relate to a human pathological pain condition. Do that as best as possible. Really show that face validity. And um, include internal and external validation where possible. Now, for the assay development, the screening and optimization component, this should include a development plan for in vitro and or in uh, ex vivo uh, assays, screening and our rationale design efforts to identify and characterize these novel assets that you're proposing for this pathological pain condition. And uh, assets can be small molecules or biologics. You have a bit of flexibility there, but devices are not responsive to this funding announcement. Um, the, uh, you know, using those milestones that you put together, these assays should be optimized and standardized and validated and quantifiable. We strongly encourage applicants to look at the NCATS assay guidance manual. Again, use your favorite NI, uh, your um, internet search engine to find that. It's a PDF that's available, freely available, and published by NCATS, which gives great guidance on how to develop assays for screening therapeutics. Okay, and now the discovery and validation of pharmacodynamic biomarkers. Pharmacodynamic markers um, represent target engagement, either direct or indirect, maybe directly in changing something very closely related to pain biology or something that's just a, another outcome measure that could be used as a surrogate. 
all right? And then um, there should be plans for internal and external validation of those pharmacodynamic markers. I'm gonna move a little fast here uh, because of time. The efficacy and pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic studies. Um, so we know that the combined measurement of PK and PD in the, pro, in the context of EVO, in vivo efficacy studies really increases drastically our understanding of a potential asset and can give us a lot of um, data and rationale for continuing this project in an optimization stage. So we strongly recommend that you develop these type of markers in your study. These pharmacokinetic markers measure the bodies of, of uh, you know, um, effects from this um, asset, either the absorption, the metabolism, and distribution, and of course, excretion of the asset and developing markers for that will really help in this therapeutic development process. Um, applications, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, applications that will be non-responsive for this U19 are those that target opiate receptors. We're looking for different targets here, all right? There are other funding mechanisms at NIH for, for, um, for studying those type of therapeutics. Um, the goal here is to really develop new ones, uh, especially not the mu opioid receptor. Okay, uh, applications that are lacking milestones will be de deemed non-responsive. Those lacking at least three of those research components that I mentioned of the five I mentioned earlier, and then you gotta give the rationale for the other ones that you're skipping. So you need at least three, because those projects that you have, uh, you know, at least three of them done, are really probably ready for the optimization stage. That's the reason why um, we have that responsiveness criteria here. Projects in the lead optimization or the IND enabling or, or clinical stage should really apply to RFA and S21-010. That's the optimization funding announcement that I mentioned. Um, and then technical development of neurostimulation or medical devices for the treatment of pain are not responsive here. There are other funding announcements for that and opportunities at NIH to support that research. It won't be done on these RFAs. And then applications to develop disease initiation, remission, relapse, or all these other types of prognostic or diagnostic biomarkers are not re responsive. The biomarker studies have to be related to the therapeutics development um, and close related to the pharma pharmacodynamic biomarkers is a good idea, all right? These applications will be withdrawn before review, all right? So I really strongly recommend that you reach out to program staff, that means NIH staff, with the components and what you'd like to do in them before you submit the application. Okay, the U19 application reviews, how is this gonna happen? What are the criteria? Of course, a strong biological rationale is essential, all right? There's two goals of the review that we've seen here. One is a strong rationale and of, for each of the components. Uh, the rigor of the supporting data, is important, either the published data or the data that's included in the application. We don't wanna hear that it's just statistically significant. We wanna you make sure that you include, um, you know, positive and negative controls, blinding, um, you know, power analysis, um, effect size, et cetera. All that needs to be included in, uh, to really show a rigorous application. We want research team expertise across all those different um, components of the therapeutic development in order to have a really competitive application that's gonna be very helpful. Um, and then that interdisciplinary team-based approach is gonna be really helpful for developing this non-addictive pain therapeutic. Um, this will be uh, evaluated in the context of, is it possible to make it to the entry criteria for that optimization stage, the NS21-010? All right, so that's how the review is gonna be done. So what's your plan for developing the therapeutic and can this group get there in five years in order to be ready for um, optimization of this hit to lead that they've identified in that U19. So the, the U19 is gonna identify a hit to lead which then could be optimized and then prepare for the IND enabling studies and in phase one in the optimization grant. So, the U19 review will also include the cohesion and synergy of those integrated projects. Are they all working to a central goal to develop that therapeutic to get it ready for the optimization stage? Look at the relationship and contribution of those research components. Are the research cores essential for the development of this project? Is the data management core sufficient to um, interact with the HEAL ecosystem and for sharing the data at the appropriate time during the projects? Um, 
they all the group should also demonstrate that 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 there's a clear advantage to conducting the proposed therapeutic development plan as a collective team rather than its separate efforts that's why we're putting together in this u19 and then the feasibility to meet those milestones the reviewers are going to be looking at that um and to, within the five years, because there's no opportunity for renewal. So can this group data done in five years? All right, so here are the different components of that U19. We have the overall integrated development plan. We have the integrated, uh, the individual research components on the right side, and then the administrative core and the research cores. All of these will have separate scores, which will lead to an overall single impact score for the proposed U19, and that's how we'll um, compare the different projects. Of course, we're going to include milestones in that overall impact score and the study timeline to make sure that the group can get it done in five years. Uh, rigor and reproducibility is going to be a central part of the review here, as, in, as it is in um, other NIH awards is the rigor of the research that's included in the grant um, demonstrated, as well as the supporting biological uh, rationale for the therapeutics development plan is the rigor of that, of, that, of that work, is that rigorous also, okay? What's the likelihood that the assays will provide uh, specificity of testing of the preferred therapeutic agent? Um, and is the, the source of the data and the rationale for calculating sam sample sizes, the parallels is re reasonable, et cetera, et cetera. All these rigor questions are very important for the research plan that you'll put, be putting together. So general recommendations for writing this proposal, if you've never read a funding announcement before, read this one. It's not like anyone you have ever seen, trust me. Um, we put a lot of time into it and uh, we put a lot of elements to it. I think that'll be exciting for the research field to see that there's an opportunity to do such a great, a really integrated project, a pro, uh, project to get to the goals of it very quickly. All five components need to be included unless you can demonstrate the work is already done. And that means demonstrating it through publications or through preliminary data in the application itself. Discuss that rigor. There are rigor guidelines on the NIH website um, look out for them, um, and there's a lot of detail there. You should discuss intellectual property plans, and uh, if possible, include a letter from your tech transfer office for protecting uh, the um, IP from this and what your plans are for the IP, and that'll help you at the later stages, okay? And then um, discuss that overall therapeutic development plan that will result from these, this hit to lead that you identify from uh, that that's discovered through this five-year project. More general recommendations include that multidisciplinary team. The review panel itself will be multidisciplinary, meaning academics, those with industry experience, those with expertise in pain biology, those with expertise in therapeutics development of assays, PK studies, um, et cetera. And then show how in that overall plan, how the integrated project will lead to the entry criteria for that optimization RFA and S21-010 um, funding announcement. And pay attention to that human subject requirements. Again, not just for clinical trials, which aren't permitted on this, but for human tissue itself. Human tissue um, is considered clinical research and requ will require a human subject session section if you are including it here. So. What is this uh, optimization RFA that I've been mentioning? I'm just going to give you a little bit of detail on it because there are other webinars that, that explain this. And that's RFA NS21-010. And uh, this is a UG3, UH3 mechanism. The overall goal of it is to support the preclinical optimization and early phase one testing to develop safe, effective, and non-addictive small molecules and biologics to treat pain. Okay. The goal of this is to accelerate this development, specific non-opioid, non-addictive analgesics. Their five-year benchmarks that they have for their overall program is to get at least five of these, uh, uh, you know, projects done, um, and, and at least three new novel analgesics from this. So we're really excited about this program. 
Here's how it fits in together with that Chevron diagram, which I hope makes much more sense to you. These, I didn't speak a lot about these R34 planning grants. They're much more straightforward again in what needs to be done. Build the team, build the biological rationale, two years, get ready for the U19, which is the initial therapeutic development one. And then the goal of this U19 is to get you ready for the UG3, UH3 optimization stage. And then the goal of that is to get you the EpicNet, which is that phase two clinical trial group. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, this is just the, for the um, optimization stage, the way that grant works is that there are um, contracts that NIH has for doing um, the data management, the PK tox, the clinical trials, the formulation, and the, um, et cetera. So the work that's really done with the researchers themselves is the bioactivity and efficacy studies. So the vast majority, the fundings for those doesn't go to the researchers. It goes to um, uh, the contracts that NIH has in place to support those projects. And for those optimization ones, we also develop a, uh, an a lead development team for of consultants um, from outside in NIH and inside NIH that have industry experience in developing therapeutics for pain and for other physiological disorders that that could um, help in the the development of formulation, developing those clinical trials and um, medicinal chemistry, et cetera. So that's how that optimization one works, and it's a really exciting program. And um, the goal here is to get those assets into that. It's a very successful program, and we would like to see lots more applications ready for it. Okay, so that's what I had to discuss about the R34, the U19, and then that UG3, UH3 mechanism. I will say that, that um, you know, the timeline for the due dates for, these, for this fiscal year are pretty tight. Um, the first set of uh, deadlines is at the end of April, that if you take a look at the funding announcement online, you'll get, I think it's April 27th. And um, if you can't, that's for the R34 and the U19s. If you can't get a full U19 to, together and you still need some components, take advantage of that R34. Get those projects started and so they can act as a feeder for the U19. But I really encourage you to take advantage of the, the, the funding announcements in this fiscal year for that first um, receipt date, if possible, because um, you know, we need to spend the money this fiscal year and we need good projects to do that. And the good projects are in your heads and in your hands to write them and get them submitted. So we really need to, you to be a partner here with us and um, submit those projects. So either submit those U19s, which we have a budget for and we're very happy to fund those. But if you're not ready for that, please put the R34s together. And now I will address your questions. Again, if you have questions about this um, after the, the, the seminar, you can reach out to myself, my name there and my email address, Michael Lashinsky at NIH.gov, DP Moapatra at NIH.gov, and Rebecca Roof at NIH.gov. All three of us were central in putting this together. Thank you. Alex, how do you want to do the questions here? Yeah, so I think if people have questions, they can submit them in the chat or uh, you, can, you raise your hand and I can call on you and then uh, feel free to join video and turn your microphone on. Please, any questions? Hey, Alex, I got a, a direct question in the chat that I thought maybe would be helpful for everybody else. Um, somebody asked me if this was replacing Ignite. Um, so I just wanna address that. Um, no, Ignite is still here. Um, this is a multi-IC program, the U19 and the R34. Um, Ignite is just for NINDS um, mission relevant things. Um, so that is a big distinction. There is going to be a little bit of overlap, um, but there is a big distinction there. Um, and, you know, also this U19 is obviously a much more comprehensive, larger scope, everything all in one place kind of mechanism. So it, it is different and it's not being replaced. Important distinction. Thank you very much, uh, Becky. So all pain, um, pathological, all painful pathological conditions are responsive to this RFA. This is a HEAL program, and it's not um, specifically for uh, 
pain conditions that are for a particular institute. So it's not only NINDS, not NIMS or, or NIDDK, et cetera, or an NCI. All these participating ICs, all the pain conditions are, will be responsive to this. So don't worry about mission relevance. What's important is responsiveness to the criteria for the RFA. I see a question in uh, the chat box from Mark Shapiro. Uh, yeah, sure, I, I can like, read it. Go ahead, DP. No, go ahead, Michael. Okay. It. Um, it seems like these funding opportunities are geared to multidisciplinary teams that are already assembled and in place, especially given the timeline. Am I basically correct here? Well, there are two different funding announcements. There's the R34 for building the team. And that's the goal of that. You do not have to have the team in place. The distinction between the R34 is you don't have the team in place, but during the R34, you will build the team and then demonstrate that the team can work together. That's the way the RFA is written for there. But the U19 requires the team already be in place or demonstrate that it can work together in some way. So you're right. The R34 is a planning grant for the U19. I hope that answers your question, that there is an opportunity for people who don't have teams yet to build a team with the R34. And there's significant funding there to do that. That 500K per year for two years should be enough to get the teams working together. Any other questions? Yep, feel free to raise your hand, we can unmute you. There's one more question in the chat box. Sure. What is the criteria to assess uh, whether the team is in place? The question is from Joshua Rosenthal. Yes, I see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. that that's a good question. So the way that the team can um, demonstrate that they're in place is that, uh, well, pub having published together is you know, a slam dunk but it's not required. Um, if they can demonstrate that uh, they can work together through the, the data that's included in the application, right? So um, if a person can organize a team that can generate a, a, a research plan that's integrated across those projects, a five-year plan where um, there's expertise for doing the assay development in this area where the pain biology is in place, et cetera, et cetera. There could be an argument made that the team doesn't necessarily have to have had work together, except they're showing a commitment to work together through the development of the application and the data that they're including in there um, supporting their ability to work together. I know it's a little nebulous. So, uh, yeah, so um, I, I hope that's a sufficient answer to the question. Clearly, working together in the, the planning grant is going to show that for the U19, that's for sure. Um, yeah, clinical trials are not okay. So, Jim, I, I see your question about the U19 and clinical studies. So, clinical studies is a very broad um, uh, the, you know, ask over here. So, doing studies in humans for efficacy are completely not responsive, all right? So I hope that's clear. Using tissue or tissue, stuff for tissue bank for validating a target, that's okay, okay? But clinical studies of humans is not permitted. All right. Um, and Jeff, yeah, you can look up the definitions for NIH for clinical trials versus human subjects research. It's, it's confusing to people if you haven't looked at it and read it carefully. Um, but that information is available. Yep, there are other mechanisms at NIH to support those clinical studies of humans. Okay. Yeah, the, Yuri Miller has a question about uh, whether NINDS have a contractor for uh, tasting the uh, non-human primates. So uh, using NIH contractors is not uh, an option for the R34 or the U19. For the optimization stage, um, those uh, the, for that the 010 um, funding announcement, 
it, it's my understanding that there are not, there isn't a part of that that includes non-human primates. So the answer would be no there. Okay, the next question is, is there an MPI mechanism? Yes, oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so the U19 can be MPI or it can be a single PI, but each component will have a, you know, a point person. Yeah. What's the general format, pages, et cetera, for a written section on research components? Yeah, so I, on the previous one of the previous slides that there, I, I haven't found the, the overall plan is twelve pages, and then um, each of those um, research plans can be six pages, and um, there you need three or five of them, and then for the the data um, coordination yeah, the admin, center, and the, admin core, data management core, and the resource core, they are all six pages each. They're all six pages, yeah. And uh, milestones, the overall milestone is two pages, and each com research component can also have milestones, two pages each. That's right. That's all in the funding announcement. There's a table in there for all the sections okay. and the page requirements. Rajesh, that's a question. Are there plans for an NINDS? to facilitate broader access to human DRGs, not with these funding announcements. Yeah. And previously there was a question whether uh, this uh, will be replayed in Zoom, uh, this webinar. So we'll, we are recording it as Alex mentioned already. So, uh, will have these links to heal websites directly. So the recording of this Zoom session will be available through a heal website. Mm -hmm. Still have more time if there's any questions from anybody. We really encourage your applications here. We're really excited about these and the potential to really change the landscape for uh, pain therapeutics development and for the options for patients. And we hope that you'll take advantage of them. Yeah, feel free to raise any question. We still have time. Sure, you can unmute and you can speak. Yeah. Hey, Michael, this is Dr. Jeff Gooden. I'm a, a pain management physician, 25 years uh, research in, in academia. Uh, we currently have uh, a grant through the HEAL initiative through NCATS to study a, a molecule. Uh, it's an endogenous molecule, but the, our, our formulation or our delivery, delivery mechanism is, is kind of unique. Um, is this something, and I, I apologize with patients, I missed the, missed the beginning, but is this something um, that if that grant is taking us through our, some of our preclinical and tox work, that this could potentially be something to help us in later stages? So there are three different funding announcements here. There's the R34 planning grant for the teams, the U19 for doing the assay development, the screening, and then the, the early PK and PD de, um, development. It seems like you're past that stage. It seems like depending on how much work you've done at your optimization and how much of the tox work you've done, like how close you are to your IND submission, the UG3, UH3 um, funding announcement that RFA NS21-010 might be right for you. Um, the contact for that is Chuck Sywin. Just do a, um, an internet search for that. And you'll see all uh, the contact information there, okay? I'll, we'll take a look, I'll look up that uh, UG3. Thanks so much. Yeah, the UG3, UH3, that might be right for you. Thanks. So if anybody would like to, co to collaborate with NCATS, that that is a possibility, okay? It is not required, but that is a possibility. And those um, um, collaborations, you know, have to be done before the grant and it should be a part of the submission, all right? Not required, but um, there is an opportunity to uh, collaborate with the NIH intramural scientists also on these um, funny announcements. Any other questions? Still have a minute or two here. Okay, we're very happy to answer questions um, afterwards. Um, the slides will be shared with uh, those who came onto the program here. Very happy to do that. And there'll be a website where you can get access to the recording afterwards also. We wanna thank everybody for attending today and your really excellent and um, attentive questions. And uh, we really look forward to you taking advantage of um, these funding announcements and uh, getting in your applications as soon as possible. We know that the first set of due dates is, is very soon, 
but um, we hope you'll take advantage of it so we, that we can spend the, the monies for this fiscal year. And uh, thanks for your help. Thank you. Again, I just uh, put the link for the NIH Heal uh, funding opportunities. That's where you can find all of the NIH Heal funding and uh, the link to this webinar will also be available there. Thank you, DP. Thanks everybody for attending. Yeah. Are we hanging out for a minute? We still have two minutes if anyone has questions. Yeah, if everybody wants yeah, to. Yeah, that's uh, true. That's fine. Is it okay if I stop the recording now? Yep. Yep.